let me introduce our, our brilliant set of speakers. So first up, my colleague, Paul Sweeney, Director of Policy and Research at the Centre for Cities, is going to set out some analysis we've been looking at spending data across our cities and towns. Um, after Paul's presentation, we'll get responses from Char Sharon Appleby, uh, Head of Business and Operations at Sunderland's Business Improvement District. Then from Richard Newland, Director of Branch and Workplace Development at Nationwide Building Society. And then Helen Dickinson, Chief Executive of the British Retail Consortium. So that's how it's going to run. Those are our speakers. Uh, without further ado, Paul, over to you. So first off, let's look at overall spend. Oh, sorry. I'm going to you. So first thing to show, and this is what this shows, is that um, spending by urban residents, and so we're looking at all urban residents in our 62 largest towns and cities, has recovered over the pandemic. Now, that in itself is pretty amazing. If you think that the UK economy has gone into the deepest recession on record, that spending is then recovered, and obviously we've had a lot of government support, is pretty amazing in itself. And then if you look in terms of the, the, sh the spread around the country, what we see is that it's recovered in or got back to, to pre-pandemic levels. So that's levels in February in every city apart from Milton Keynes. So, again, that's pretty remarkable that there has been that, that recovery. Of course, you know, there was a fall off uh, in the, during the first lockdown in particular. But you can see sort of through, through May, June and July, then there was these increases since. Um, Milton Keynes, as you can see there, is the, is the city that's seen the slowest recovery. And then Sunderland, which is good news for Sharon, actually has been the city that's seen the strongest recovery. Now, in terms of how that's played out across the country, it's tended to be linked to the, the, the affluence of, of different cities. And so what's interesting is that those less affluent places are the places that have seen the lowest falls in spend. And also those very same places, those less affluent places, have also been the places that have seen the biggest bounce back to and have recorded the, the highest value of spend um, in that recovery phase. And that's what these chart, two charts show. So average wages up the side, lowest level that they've, they've reached um, in sort of June, uh, June 2020. You can see there that those places with lower wages have tended to have uh, sort of lower levels of uh, lower drops. So have had a, a higher level of, of fall, if that makes sense. So for, for the least is what I should be saying. On the other side, you can see here in terms of, again, average wages and then the spending peak that these places have seen. It's those places with lower wages that have seen um, the highest peak reached in that recovery phase too. Now, there were two reasons for this. The first is that less affluent places spend more of their, their money, more of their pounds on essential items. So there's actually less like groceries. So there's less room to cut back in terms of spending. But interestingly, the second reason is that when we look at non-essential spend, so say spending in, in pubs or going out for a meal or, or whatever it is, those less affluent places also seen less of a fall in that, in that non-essential spend too. Now, the reasons for that, we're not entirely clear as to why is the case with the data that we've got. And hopefully we'll get hold of that data and investigate that more in the coming weeks and months. So that's sort of overall patterns of spend. Now let's try to dig into this a little bit more because as ever, the headline spending always hides a bit of, um, or a lot of variation underneath that, a lot of which is, is very interesting from a policy perspective. So I'll introduce two concepts here um, to understand this a bit more. Um, first, we've got the, uh, the element of online spend v offline spend. So by offline, we mean spending in physical outlets or you know, brick, the traditional bricks and mortar. And online obviously is, is through the laptops that no doubt many of you are looking at right now. And then we've got the types of spending. So we've got essential spend in things like groceries that you, you need irrespective of what's going on in the economy and then spend on non-essential items. So it is that spend on in pubs, in, in restaurants, you know, in, in perhaps retail things, in, in gift shops, for example, that you don't necessarily need to buy, but you really want to because you have the money in your pocket. And what we see here from this chart is that that green line, that non-essential spend in, uh, in physical outlets and physical retailers and bars and cafes, that's the spend that's taken the hit over the pandemic. So you can see this, that, that green line very much follows the pattern that we saw for overall, overall spending. Um, but interestingly, we do even see a recovery in that. You know, it's not quite um, back to where it was in February levels, but it's got almost there in September time before dropping off a bit in October. If you then look at the other elements of spend, you can see that they've been fairly constant. So if you look at essential spend in physical retailers and, and the like, you can see that that's pretty flat throughout apart from the spike that we see as, as the first lockdown came in, as, as panic buying happened. And then we look at online spending, you can see again, that's, that's fairly flat. So the purple line is, is essential items online. So maybe if you're doing Tesco online or, or Waitrose online rather than go to the supermarket, you can see there as the lockdown came in, there was a bit of an increase. And then it's been sort of, sort of flattened out a little bit, but it's been fairly flat throughout. 
In terms of online spending in non-essential, so all those things that maybe you've been buying on, on Amazon, um, you can see that actually that didn't really respond where, as the pandemic or the lockdown first came in, but it's gradually creeped up since. But having said that, what's interesting is that there hasn't been a ginormous increase uh, in online spend, despite what some commentators were predicting about the, you know, the, sort of the pandemic accelerating the trends we've already seen. And that's what this chart shows. It looks at the share of the pound um, by urban residents that goes online. Uh, Cambridge is the capital of online spending. As you can see, it's right at this end of the, the chart. In February, that's, um, it was just under 25%. And then the green bars show sort of how much increase we've seen through the pandemic. Um, looking fast forwarding to October. And what you can see there is that, again, online has increased as a share of all spend across all 62 large towns and cities that we look at. Well, that spend hasn't been ginormous. You know, we're talking about an average of 20% of up to 25%. Now still, you know, a 5 percentage point increase is big, but if you then sort of bear in mind that nightclubs aren't open at the moment, there are other businesses that probably haven't opened, and then there'll be another set of businesses that probably aren't doing the trade they would be doing because of social distancing rules, think restaurants, for example, that would suggest that maybe that 25% is still higher than what it would be like in a, in a post-pandemic world, whatever that actually looks like when, if and when we, we finally get there, which is sooner rather than later, we hope. Um, which that offers so, you know, some, some hope for the high street that yes, online spending has gone up, but perhaps not as high as, as what some commentators were, were predicting. But clearly, you know, despite that, you know, and despite a lot of, sort of bricks and mortar re retails sort of, and restaurants, et cetera, sort of recovering close back to February levels, they've still taken a massive hit over this period, which is what that big dip showed. And, you know, if we then count that in terms of um, lost weeks of sales, an estimate that we've made, you can see that, that even in Sunderland on that far right hand side, you know, the place that where bricks and mortar retailers have seen that the lowest number of lost weeks still amounts to six weeks of lost sales, which is a huge amount of, of revenue that's been lost. And then at the other end, you know, Milton Keynes has the ignominy of being at the other end uh, once again, and now it's 12 weeks of lost spend um, for uh, the amount that urban, urban or residents of Milton Keynes are spending in, in physical shops. Now the final thing I want to, to go at, so that's looking at online for the offline, is to then look at, in terms of that offline spend, that spend in physical bricks and mortar, where has that happened? Has it happened in local high streets or has it happened in city centres? And again, this has been something, an argument that's been raging in, in recent months about has the pandemic then shifted spend to, to local centres and is, is this really good news for, for local high streets? Well, three lines here. First line shows overall spend, which is that light green line there. The magenta purpley line shows the um, shows the spend in non-essential uh, offline, so non-essential bricks and mortar, which I've showed you um, before. And then the final line, which is the new line, the green one, is spending in city centres, and that's by residents or non-residents. So anybody coming to spend within city centres. And what you can see here is that purple line, that spending in non-essential retail in, in physical shops uh, more generally has recovered more quickly than spending in city centres and is now at a higher level as a result. Which suggests that actually, you know, local high streets have recovered more quickly than what uh, than what city centres have. But there are two points to make here. The first is that if you split that by size, in terms of city size, what you see is that small and medium sized city centres actually have recovered in line with non-essential spend. And so it's not been a case that their city centre spending is, is lagged behind. It's been large cities in London that are very much dri driving this pattern. And indeed, if you look at our high street recovery tracker, where we've been tracking the, the recovery of city centres in recent months, which is on our website and sponsored by Nationwide, we've been tracking and showing exactly how that's played out and the extent that, that London and large city centres like Manchester and Glasgow have really struggled um, since March. The second point to make is that, yes, you know, this data suggests that local high streets have recovered more quickly. But it is worth bearing in mind that this purple line here is not quite back to 100 percent so it's not quite back to february level so while the recovery has been quicker it's still not really back to to even where we were pre-pandemic which doesn't suggest that this has been a great sort of boon for the local high street and that actually now you know the city center's loss has been the local high streets gain. it seems to be actually just that that spending is a little bit less uh, overall rather than local high streets capturing some of that that city center stuff despite working from home so to sum up um, spending has recovered, overall spending has recovered back to pre-lockdown levels in October, which bodes well for, um, for bouncing back from, from subsequent restrictions. Um, even with the rise of online state spending, data suggests that bricks and mortar retail has bounced back, which is a, a good news story. Um, but this is a particularly a challenge thing for bricks and mortar in city centres of large cities in particular, which has struggled throughout. And it's only likely to be the return of workers and potentially tourists that will change this. Thanks very much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Paul. Uh, and as Paul said, you know, the work that he's just presented there is part of the, 
bigger program of work that we have been uh, undertaking pretty much since uh, the pandemic and lockdown came about looking at the performance of our cities and our city centres both now but also then thinking about what that means for them in the future. So let's turn to get some responses from our uh, our great panel. So first off, Sharon, give us the, the view from Sunderland, what's going on uh, from your patch. Great, thanks Andrew and, and thanks Paul. Absolutely fascinating stuff there. Now we've worked with Paul all the way through um, the pandemic actually and have, have been following the Centre for Cities tracker and that has helped us to inform some of our response. Um, and I'm going to go through really what our response has been from a public perspective and also a response from a business perspective and some of the things that that we think have helped actually in um, in Sunderland along the whole along the whole journey. So like everyone, we right in the very beginning set up a task force. I'm not going to dwell on that because you all know what they are. We followed the High Street Task Force recovery model, which has worked very well for us. Um, but one of the key things that we did really focus on was all of the evidence and insight that, that was coming out. We commissioned our own research um, to find out how the consumer was feeling about coming back. But we've also tracked um, research right across, um, th right across the piece, including British Bids research, the IPM research, all of that. And we've, and we've worked with all of that to make sure it's helped us to inform how we have approached the recovery. So... The first set of research we did was with the consumer and that then gave us an indication of what would make them feel comfortable to come back. The massive thing that came out of that, and I'm sure it's not unusual for any of you on this call, it was around visible um, visible safety measures, want, knowing that they would feel safe, that they would, there would be enough cleansing, there would be enough people to, to help to marshal, there'd be enough signage, there'd be all of that. So we did that and we did all of that in a very welcoming way. So we didn't want black tape everywhere and, you know, that kind of thing. We did a really, really colourful, engaging campaign. Um, and that worked very well. Our, our um, footfall recovered very quickly and Paul's obviously touched on some of the reasons for that. And it stayed, um, it stayed really high. We then had um, an increase in cases towards the end of the summer. And we then started to really flip the messaging again to become much more um, encouraging and asking people to do the right thing and to help us to stop the spread. And we did a very visible campaign around that again. And um, at that point, though, we were getting the feeling, the sense from customers, because we kept we kept doing the research, that they were feeling that people weren't complying anymore and actually we needed some more challenge. So we brought marshals in at that point. We've had five marshals for six days a week since the end of sep um, since September, and they have gone down very well. So the evidence, again, and, and the insight from that is we were at 60 percent mask, mask wearing compliance we're now at 95 percent plus now they are still there they will remain in the city center for the foreseeable future the council have also um recruited more but it has been the bid and the health um the health authority actually who have funded all of that um prior to to just the christmas period so that then did give people more confidence that people that, that you know there were people out there helping them to um to stay safe managing queues all of that kind of stuff um and so our footfall remained remained strong, remained high. And um, we do have a lot of people who come in to do the banking every day. Who we've got a very much a cash economy in Sunderland, although you know more of it is moving. We are discovering more and more businesses that don't take card and aren't interested in taking card, that kind of thing. So we're working on some things like that moving forwards. In terms of our response with businesses, clearly the public response helps the businesses regardless, but we've been there to help and support them all the way through. The bid have worked all of the way through. We only furloughed a couple of people for a short time, so we have been really visible on the streets in the city centre the whole time. Um, and we've been engaging with businesses in a different way to the way that we did before. And that has been really appreciated. That will change our bid model moving forwards as well. Um, in terms of how we respond and how we work with our businesses. We've also worked really closely with our local authority on the reopening the high street fund and we've been able to introduce a number of initiatives, some through the fund, some not, um, just more recently around things like a Sunderland gift card, which we've got over £40,000 worth of orders on that already in the first few weeks, which hopefully the businesses will see the benefit of in the in the new year. We've introduced a scheme on parking perks. I'm sure loads of you on this call will feel the pain around parking charges and the discussion that goes around that. Parking perks is a great initiative around um, to reduce parking charges and also um, Shop Happy we are introducing in the new year as well to help independents clearly more than um, more than the nationals. Now 
I've just mentioned this, lots of the work we've been doing has highlighted issues around digital exclusion for businesses, cash businesses, and they are terrified of tech. So we have a huge job to do as we move forward um, on that front. But I think there's two other th key things for us that, that have worked very well in the, in the whole period. Um, and that has been the partnership that we've managed to strike up, not just through the task force, but just in general. So we've worked really closely with, um, with the council, but also with the police, with education providers, with the health providers, and with a huge range of businesses. And we couldn't have done this without their support. And I think um, that's really, really crucial that I hear nightmare stories about how bids don't work well with the local authorities that is a nightmare I can't imagine trying to do this job without having a, a good relationship with the local authority and um, and the other thing that has been brilliant for Sunderland actually is the good news we have continued not shied away from at all pushing the good news about all of the investment that's come into Sunderland the LNG investment station redevelopment and we've continued to push that all the way through the pandemic and that has certainly raised confidence, not just in consumers, but also in businesses. We're seeing at the moment new businesses start to open. The agents are reporting an 80% increase in, in interest for the smaller premises. So, you know, maybe startups or businesses that are trying to scale up from working from home, you know, that kind of thing. So some really interesting good news there. And, and I think that will only continue to develop as the regeneration of the city continues. Um, so for me, I think, you know, we've, we have done a good job. We've worked really hard. People have come back. Um, so I I'm, I'm definitely don't think that online is, is going to, you know, con is going to cause us too much of a problem into the future. Brilliant. Thank you very much uh, indeed, Sharon. So much uh, in that, you know, interest in the kind of the pandemic has pushed, you know, as you were saying, the businesses to think about the use of technology when maybe they were cash based. And then some of the final points you make, which we'll come back to, which is about the broader package of investment and activity that is going on in places and thinking about our high streets in that context. Because, you know, as you said, Sunderland is thinking more generally about the future of its city centre. Um, and how it becomes a place to live and a place to work as well as a place to, to shop, which I'm sure we'll come back to uh, as well when we get into the, the, the question and answer session. Richard, uh, give us a view from uh, Nationwide. Obviously, you've got branches all over the place, so your views. Thanks, Andrew, and thank you, Sharon. Good morning, everybody. Um, so Nationwide, for those of you not familiar with us, we have around 650 branches nationwide. We're a mutual, so we're owned by our members. And therefore, that gives us a little bit more flexibility about how we make some longer term decisions about the number of branches and the location of them. Um, it's interesting to hear Sharon talk about Sunderland. We've invested in Sunderland significantly over the last couple of years. And the vibrancy and energy that Sharon and team are injecting is something I think others should replicate uh, in the UK. And we see others doing a great job, but I thought I'd just recognise what I've seen. And, and you know, it helps us with our investment decision, the sort of work that Sharon has done with her bid in Sunderland. So our perspective, so um, we've seen behavior change significantly as you would imagine over the last six or seven months in terms of how people are using our branches. And what it does mean is it begs the question in the medium term, what happens when this terrible crisis passes? And therefore, do we see the sort of patterns of behavior we're seeing how people use physical space, something that becomes the new normal? And again, a bit of an over, overused, I think in my opinion, uh, de description or is it something that will enhance the role of the branch and uh, make it very clear what the branch is for and there's for what the other channels can be used for as well. Our objective and our summary at the moment is we think the branches are absolutely vital to our success. People do want that face-to-face -face, particularly in times of crisis or where they want some help and support they want the reassurance of being able to come into a branch and have a face-to-face -face conversation. So firstly, we think physical space has a very important role to play. I also think we are investing in digital, so give our, our members a uh, choice about how and where they do want to choose to bank with us, although we're not a bank. But I think that blend of those two things, while continuing to invest in physical space, is something that becomes incredibly important and will be incredibly important to Nationwide. Um, 650 branches, we own about two thirds of those. So we have a slightly unique perspective, not only being a tenant on the high street, as it were, but also being a landlord. And that comes through in how we look at the high street or the town centre. So you may have seen we've almost we've all, we've, all, we've just recently uh, uh, re um, 
uh, reissued our branch promise. So the branch promise was in place and was going to last until May of next year. And basically what the branch promise says is that any town or city that has a branch today will have one until May 2021. We've now extended that and reissued it and being very proud of the fact that we think that should still be the case until January 2023. Um, so that's our commitment to the high street in terms of what we're saying to our members and to the public in general, because we believe the high street still has a key role to play. Uh, we also invested significantly. So over the last three and a half years, we've invested and upgraded around 250 by the end of this financial year of our branches, spending around about 250 million pounds on the high street, upgrading our branches, both the experience as well as the look and feel, which can only enhance some high streets up and down uh, the UK. I, I also think the other things we're doing, which is working in partnership with the centre of cities, as well as, you know, I, I chair on behalf of Nationwide, the Swindon Towns Fund Board. We think it's really important that we continue to invest and innovate on the high street about how people want to use it. But you've got to give them a reason to visit. And all of these things are not revolutionary, but I think understanding you know, the fact that shopping generally in a town centre is a relatively modern phenomenon in terms of shopping centres. You go back 50, 60, 70 years, the town centre was a place where people would come together, where the community would talk to each other, you would meet for a coffee, you would do some shopping, it was market day, but also live in the town centre. And those sort of things, as we all know, are the sort of ingredients, which are not magic, but the ingredients that you need to have a thriving, vibrant, interesting town centre, which I think is what we all want and what Nationwide is committed to. So in summary, we are committed to having a vibrant uh, and investing and keeping our branches open. We've made a public commitment and we've made an investment and we'll continue to do so. And we are seeing changes during COVID how people want to use their branch. But we also think that blend of both digital and of, and of physical is really important. So we need to use technology, but it needs to be made meaningful by our people who are the crown jewels of our organization, which is why they're award winning and what our members continue to want and demand, particularly through times of crisis and stress as we're sitting right now. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you very much indeed, uh, Richard. And questions are coming in, but keep them coming in um, and we'll, we'll get to them once we've heard from um, Helen. Some interesting questions around and something you just touched on, Richard, about you, know, you own a lot of your branches and so the ownership question becomes an interesting one for our future uh, town and city centres and that has the direct relationship to bids as to whether landlords and or owners should be more involved rather than just the users or the occupiers paying which I'm sure you'll have a view on that as well um, Sharon but Helen you've waited patiently over to you give us the give us I the macro view. I don't know if there's anything uh, anything uh, anything left to, to to say after some great openings from people who, who touched on many of the things that I was going to say. I mean, I suppose my my overarching point, which has come through, I think, in, in um, many of the comments already, is that uh, we must um, not characterise as online versus offline or physical versus digital. And while we measure many of these things, thinking about it as, as shoppers, as customers, we don't think about things as separate channels. So this integration of physical and digital is, is really the, the, the future sort of um, lens that we should be taking um, to, to, to certainly, certainly from a retail perspective. And, and the pandemic, I think, um, has had a huge impact on, on the, 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 the retail landscape and it's accelerated many of the changes that we were already seeing pre-March pre 2020. Um, the whole idea that high streets equal shopping or you know, places and shopping are one and the same thing is, 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 is not right. Certainly from a retail point of view, um, uh, it's interesting, I was uh, really interested in Paul's data because certainly we, we also collect data and it may be that I think Paul's data in, in terms of looking at what's happening online is looking across um, you know, tr travel, other sorts of consumer spending that isn't just retail. So taking a narrow retail perspective just for a second. So having said, don't think about online and offline as, as, as two separate things. I'm just going to dig into the data for a second. Um, and 
for retail, the increase in online has been very significant over the course of the pandemic. We've seen year on year online non-food retail sales increase by between 40 and 60 percent year on year. Um, it depends whether there was a sort of backdrop of a lockdown, um, but you know that that is a very chunky increase. Previous to uh, February, March this year, that number was probably uh, around five. So a huge uptick. Um, and we're also, you know, we were also seeing people researching more online before um, making a, a you know physical visit. So again, coming back to that integration. So, so that, that reset of the relationship between physical and digital retailing is going to have implications for the, for the number of jobs in retail in the future, um, the nature of those jobs, the implications from the way that business is done, particularly around sustainability and in the environment, and implications for, for place and space, which is, I guess, what we're talking about here. And again, I think it was highlighted in some of the data that's already been shared, but you know, over the course of the pandemic, footfall has been down in, in, um, in physical places. So retail footfall I'm talking about here. Retail footfall was down 65% in November. Obviously, that had the backdrop of that second um, England-wide lockdown. And even pre-November, it was still down um, about 30%. So that's retail footfall as opposed to retail uh, footfall overall. Um, and, you know, we did see every sort of retail business I spoke to talked about the greater impact in cities, in urban centres than perhaps in more local areas. And I think, you know, there are various things that are at play in there. There's the trend that we were seeing already. There's the impact of restrictions. There's the impact of tourism. So we haven't mentioned the loss of tourists, uh, you know, a big part of our urban um, economies, whether that is in London or right around the whole of the UK, and the impact of changing working practices. So, you know, while big proportions of the population are working from home, and so physical retail sales uh, were down about, at best, um, during the course of this year by about 10%. So, how many of those impacts are going to stay? Uh, versus um, uh, rever uh, reverse, I think, is, is the question that we need to be asking ourselves. So tourism is going to come back, she says optimistically. Restrictions are going to get lifted one day, she also says optimistically. Question, though, whether we are going to see a permanent shift in working patterns. So you know, while it may revert back, will it revert back to what it was before? Um, because that will have particularly an impact on, on again, our urban centres and will uh, that this permanent shift in terms of the, the where the final sale gets transacted, are we going to see that, uh, that step change that I described earlier actually, actually um, stick? And so I, I think, you know, we need to, we need to recognise that um, for retail, it will have a smaller footprint in terms of its physical space in the future, but absolutely, as everybody I think has said so far, it it still has a vital place, a vital role to play in 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 in, in local communities and in urban areas, uh, and it will be that combination of of online and offline, you know, a much closer connection of, of physical and digital uh, together in terms of thinking about how it manifests itself in. In, um, in physical space. So whether that is through, you know, a showroom to touch an experience and to feel something, um, uh, to, to um, actually um, be, be part of a, um, an engagement with the customer, you know, customer service to be able to, to, to the services that are being offered, to book an appointment, to go into store, to think of, of physical retailing in a much broader sense with that connectivity with digital. And I think from a place point of view, taking it back up to, you know, whether it's cities or high streets or town centres, having that, um, that sort of shared vision that, uh, that those communities have really a vibrant future that uh, incorporates retail, but that also is beyond retail, that includes care in the community. 
you know, we have an aging population as the virus has, has shown us the vulnerability of, of that. How can we improve our local care services of culture, of leisure, of housing, um, and a, a much broader definition of, of community space. And all of that requires local leadership, local stakeholders, particularly the involvement of, of local authorities, um, and the resources and expertise to, to at a local level to be able to achieve it, which is why Sharon's story on on Sunderland is, um, you know, is so uplifting because that's exactly the sort of um, local leadership and local involvement that uh, I think everybody should uh, to take note of. It also requires government intervention, so central government intervention. We need a business rate system that's fit for purpose. Uh, we were talking before the, um, the session started about the relief on business rates that will, uh, that has been so, so valuable for, for retail and for hospitality businesses this year. Um, we need to ensure that we still have some targeted relief um, during the course of, of next year, because there's a, there's a cliff edge sort of looming in terms of it all reverting back to what it was before in April 2021. We need the reinstatement of the VAT export scheme, which government is saying they're going to take away because that, that impacts that tourism angle. We need great use of the levelling up fund. Somebody already has mentioned the, um, the High Street Task Force and how using the expertise to draw down and share that across the economy. So there is, there is a role for local, there is a role for, for, for national governments, um, and there is a, you know, a real need, I think, for us all to align behind a, a shared vision of a much broader use of local spaces, and from a retail point of view, you know, a much closer connection and, and seamless integration between digital and physical, and not seeing them as fighting each other, but being part of the, 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 the same solution. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed, um, <clears throat> Helen. And, and the point you start with, and indeed finished, about thinking about offline and uh, online as, you know, in our world, you would see them as complements, not necessarily substitutes. That's the way that we, you know, in a sense, they work together rather than they work against each other is a, an incredibly useful way. Now, we've had loads of questions, as many of them are brilliant. Paul, I'm just forewarning you, you know what happens when you put a place on a chart. Several questions about, tell us about Milton Keynes and why it's it's why it's the lowest ranked place. Sharon's told us why Sunderland is the top ranked place. So bear in mind when it comes to you, you're going to, you know, be, be warned. You have to have an answer for the MK uh, question and a couple of we've had uh, questions um, on, uh, on that. But I want to touch also on this point. Um, Helen picked it up. Um, it's, we've had a couple of questions. So Danny Mason, Danny, are you on the call? If you are, Danny, can you unmute and ask your question about um, the recovery? And uh, that relates to another question I want to, to put to the team as well. So, uh, Danny, are you about? Yes, I'm here. No. Can you hear me? I can. Ask away. Yeah, Paula, just in your presentation, you talked a couple of times about recovery and back to pre-pandemic levels, but are we taking into account seasonality there? Or, you know, because October spend, I guess, you might expect to be different to February spend. It doesn't Great. want to... Just... One second, Paul, because this relates to a... Uh, another question which I've been asked by Jane Reynolds, who who's picks up on your point, Helen, which is, you know, the macro trends for retail have been sort of angling down in some respects. Um, and so what does recovery then look like? I mean, in a sense, what should we expect? Should we expect places to be back to what they were? Or is, you know, what's the vision of success that we should be kind of thinking about? So, Paul, you tuck in on um, on that first question and then I'll get Helen to come on the back of that. And Sharon, maybe you can say, you know, what does what is success for for Sunderland? Is it pegged to something in the past, or is it, you know, is it essentially not that? So, Paul, over to you. Great question, Danny. Um, no, we're pegging everything back to February levels, partly because we're seeing a pretty unprecedented situation. So it's interesting to know how far back are you going to get. But interestingly, when we have then compared the data for overall spend to October levels last year, what we see is that, that that baseline period for February looks very similar to what the October picture looks like for last year. So clearly February is not going to be representative of a November or December situation, but it seems at the very least that it is representative of, of October at the very least. So seasonality will, will have a, an impact, but we don't think it will distort the, the figures because of that cross check that we did. Great. Thank you very much, Paul. Helen, uh, I mean, pick that up. Seasonality is obviously a big issue in the retail 
uh, industry, but more around, you know, what is the measure of success in terms of a recovery? What should we be really looking out for in the in the retail world? I think um, you've got to, uh, the thing to look out for is, is sort of what's behind, like, uh, like all these things, the devil's in the detail, but what's behind the headlines. So, you know, while overall retail sales might have picked up to similar levels to um, previous, within that, there is huge variations dependent on geography, on category, um, and on channel. So we've talked a little bit about um, um, physical versus um, digital, but you know, if you look at if you look at cities versus local areas or certain cities. So, so it's, uh, again, it was in Paul's data. I think you know it's the it's the Londons of this world. So the, the more the the better off places in the first place are the the ones that are, have been hit most. Um, and you look at categories of retail. So obviously, you know, the, the obvious one is sort of food because that's an essential item, but everything that's associated with working from home, um, anything that's associated with our homes. So, you know, sofas, computers, desks, th not quite through the roof, that's a bit uh, uh, topical with uh, homes, but you know, doing relatively well, whereas clothing, beauty, so things that are associated with us um, going out or going on holiday uh, have, have, have been hit hardest. So I think the, so, so coming back to your question, how will we know when we've got there? We will know when we've got there when we don't see these major swings that are, you know, place dependent because people can't go on public transport and the hence won't go into city centres. People won't buy clothes because they're not going on holiday. So some of that rebalancing, if you like, within the headlines that sort of might look like on the face of it that's, that it's all all right. Whereas within that, there are some people who are really, really struggling. And uh, that, that sort of comes back to how you make sure you target the support to those that are at that bottom end to make sure that those viable business can, can, uh, can survive their way through to that uh, happy upland that we all hope will feature at some point during 2021. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, Sharon, you, you know, measure of success, getting back to what you were, getting back to something different, not, you know, I mean, how do you think about that? What's, what's the next 12, 24, 36 months look like for, for Sunderland? I think for us, it has to be um, sustained, sustained levels of, of where we, where we are and then continuing to grow as places like our local authority come back other offices and things like that do start to come back. And with the redevelopment going on and things happening on a regular basis, we need to continue to see the growth. I think the other thing for me is about trying to keep some of the share that we have undoubtedly won from places like Newcastle and Durham, where people would would naturally go as well. They're not going, they are coming to Sunderland or staying in Sunderland rather than leaving to go somewhere else. I would like to think that we will be able to keep some of that because actually um, people are enjoying it who maybe haven't enjoyed it for a while because of the competition. So I, I think for me, continuing to grow the footfall obviously would be would be good and keeping some of the share that we've won okay very good um Richard a quick thought for you you know I mean from a slightly different perspective but you know your measures of success in terms of either the branch network or indeed uh you know the the, the nationwide presence the places that you're in I mean how do you think about that so we measure it in a couple of ways. I think there's the, the sentiment tracker that our people tell us about how they feel about working, particularly during a pandemic, and what it's like interacting with our members and are we able to give the best service we're able to offer. I, I think there's the commercial, you know, we are a building society owned by our members, but we still have a commercial imperative, you know, how successful are we converting customers to buy stuff from us and, you know, and how competitive are we versus the competition. And a huge part of that buying decision is about location and service and those two things for us are intertwined as well as ease of doing business with us whether it's on the high street for convenience or whether it's that blend I mentioned earlier where you have a seamless interaction using channels the other channels as well but the, the town centre just going back to Sharon's point I think the one thing I think retail is dependent upon and workplace dependent on retail is the ability for people to get back into the office and work in a different way I think post pandemic I look after workplace as well as retail at Nationwide. I think it's really important giving our people choice, but I do think people will, and there's a pent-up demand for people to come back into the office, and therefore 
the success of a town centre is not only community and shopping, but also living and working, the ability to work in the town centre and how quickly that returns is something I think we should keep an eye on because I think the success of the high street and the town centre is intrinsically linked into that as well. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, Miranda Sharp. Miranda, if you're on the call, you've asked two questions. Can you ask you? I'll ask your first one, which is what what's so special about Milton Keynes? So, Paul, get ready to answer that. But if you can come on and ask your second question, because it relates to a point that Sharon raised and indeed Helen raised as well. Miranda, so I'll wait over to you. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, and I'm really interested in the Milton Keynes question, because previously, as a fan of the tracker, you know, Blackburn and Bournemouth, which we saw have big effects in the summer, were understandable. Milton Keynes I don't get at all. Uh, but my question for the panel is what impact do you think the shift away from cash is having on these figures? Because uh, clearly it'll be material for a number of sectors and places. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Miranda. Many people don't get Milton Keynes on so many different uh, levels. That's a broader conversation. I happen to love the place, but that's that's just my own uh, quirks. Um, Sharon, you you mentioned this about you know encouraging the use of technology. Say something about you know that changed behaviour. You know, picking up on Miranda's question about um, the cash economy, and I'll get Helen and Richard to comment on that, and then Paul can take pick up the what's special about Milton Keynes, Sharon. I think from a from a cash point of view, what has really surprised us is how many people still want to use cash, but also how how many businesses actually do also still want to take cash. And there is a big dilemma there, I think, in terms of businesses being comfortable just taking that for whatever reason um, and being actually quite open to tell you that that's what they want to continue to do. And um, and the, the move towards the more safety cashless transaction type of element as well so I don't I'm not sure I have an answer on it I just think that there is a lot of work to continue to do in a place like Sunderland um not necessarily just in the city centre but actually we have five neighbourhoods around the outside of the city centre and that's where we've got some big issues around um around those types of businesses and I think it's just giving us um some real food for thought and some a lot of work to do in the future to convert more of that across yeah okay very good um, uh, Helen, you know, just just a comment on, you know, the shift from or to cash economy away from or towards it in the pandemic and more broadly. What's, what are your reflections on that? Um, I, I, you know, I think we have seen a, a major shift. I don't think it will reverse, um, but I do think it is important, picking up on Sharon's point, that uh, access to cash is and perhaps um, also uh, uh uh, Richard's point, it just access to cash is really important for some people. So while that shift is there, while people should have options, um, that those options should include still being able to pay by cash because there are, you know, a not insubstantial proportion of our society that don't have a access to digital payment methods. And therefore, you know, those people shouldn't be um, uh, ostracised from, from being able to, you know, Shop in, a, shop, in a, shop in a normal way. Yeah, that's a very good point. Richard, obviously you are a financial institution. Your comment on or reflection on the cash to non-cash or non-cash to cash? Yeah, so I, I think, sorry, before we do that, I'm also a huge fan of Milton Keynes. Um, Andrew, I lived there for 10 years. For what it's worth, I think Milton Keynes is a really interesting, it doesn't really have much of a town centre. It's a shopping centre, it's its high street. So maybe that's what's distorting the results you're getting. Anyway, that's my view. Um, we are committed to maintaining free cash for our members, so our cash network. We are seeing a decline, but to Helen's point, I think you must remember that not everybody is comfortable using different forms of payment apart from cash. For a lot of people, for a huge part of our population, what we understand is that they use cash to help them budget, and therefore the access to cash and the use of cash, despite COVID, and it's also worth reflecting, as I, as I used the word earlier on, um, COVID is distorting trend. We're not sure what's going to happen to the use of cash, to how people use branches, how people come and use the high street, larger versus smaller. And therefore, you know, a brighter person than I can probably predict some of those trends. But at the moment, whatever the normal will return to, um, I, I also wouldn't underestimate people's ability to be a bit like an elastic band and ping back to what they were doing before. I'd like to see some kind of shift, but at the moment it's difficult to understand what the long term is going to be because some of the data is distorted. And, you know, a statistician, guys like you, Andrew, and your team, it must be difficult to predict those trends where you have a distortion that's having a huge effect on what long term trends could be. Well, quite. I mean, I think that is the, the crux of where we are, you know, in a sense of 
how much of what we've seen will stick um, over time. Um, and there is, you know, there is a time implication associated uh, with that as well. Paul, you've had enough preempting and pre-warning. Give us the Milton Keynes answer. So why specifically is Milton Keynes at the very bottom of the pile? We yes. don't know for sure. Oh, that's such a you, disappointing answer. <laughs> uh -huh. But if you look at, I mean, think about Milton Keynes as being representative of, as a broader group of cities, mainly based in the greater southeast, which have got pretty affluent residents because of the strength of the economy and the skills that they have. And what we see is it's that cohort that have really scaled spending back. So why is it that it appears that the skills spend a little bit more, back a little bit more in, in Milton Keynes and London? We don't know. But it is representative of a broader trend, which I think is the interesting thing to take away, which is this, you know, a more affluent places um, are, are cut back spending more than what uh, less affluent places have. Very good. Thank you very much, uh, Paul. Um, so we've had several questions on the on sort of the putting it into the bigger context. Um, and I want to try and uh, address that as we get into the last uh, 10 minutes or so. Tony Smith, Tony, are you on the call? Can you ask your question about work, you know, patterns of working with home and what you, you know, because again, it goes to this question about how much do we think of this will stick? And if we think a lot of it sticks, then that leads us to a bunch of different policy implications. And if we think actually it won't stick a lot. Tony, are you on the call? He's not. So this is Tony's question. So Tony's question is, if we move to a pattern of commuting, say only two days or three days a week, won't we just concentrate our retail activity in those two days? Less true of pubs and restaurants, but could physical retail spend go back to something like normal, uh, quote unquote, in cities, uh, pre-existing trend away from department stores to smaller ones? So this is your crystal ball moment in a sense of you have to make several judgments about stickability and all the rest of it. Um, Helen, <laughs> you go first. Look into the future and tell us what it's all about. I mean, you know, I was, it's a tough one, but part of the story is why we see some places struggling is, you know, quite dramatic changes in the way people work and the frequency which they're in, you know, localities as opposed to where they currently uh, live. We don't fully know how that's going to play out, but just, just, you know, surmise on some of those issues. My personal view, for what it's worth, is that I do not think we will revert back to the working patterns that we had before. So urban areas, I mean, I live in London, but I, it's pretty consistent across many cities across the UK. And it were pretty much, I mean, not across the piece, dependent on people tra traveling in mostly on public transport, mostly five days a week to go into an office. And I have not spoken to anybody who thinks that we will get back 100% to where we were before. So, so, so point one is, you know, we're not going back to where we were before. So if, if we're here and that was there, then you've got a continuum sort of question. Is it sort of a half, is it halfway there? Yeah. Is it three quarters of the way there? Um, I actually, you know, I think the, the, the sort of consensus that I, the people I talk to is that we will get sort of closer to what we had before than what we've got now. I'm, I maybe question that a bit, but you know, it's all about your, sort of your own perspectives, I guess, and, and that of your organization. Um, I think what it does mean though, from a, from a workplace point of view is that we need to think about the, you know, what workplaces look like. So more collaboration spaces, more flexible spaces, uh, more, you know, more places that people can drop in and come out of rather than, you know, a fixed desk that you sat in between nine and five and then went home. Um, and again, from a retail point of view, I think that has implications for, you know, back to the sort of theme of, of what we've been discussing is, is <clears throat> it has to be, people have to have a reason to want to, to go to, you know, a retail location or a, um, a you know, a, or a place more widely, whether it's for, for leisure or um, uh, culture, as, as well as for retail. And that means that, you know, there's more to be done in terms of, you know, what is that reason that I will uh, make that um, journey uh, that has to be much more than just around a trans, a physical sort of transaction. There's got to be a point to it that is going to be interesting to me for, for a wider reason than I just physically want to, to buy something because I could do that in, in many other different ways. Yeah, no, that's a very good point. Sharon, I'll come to you in a second. Um, Richard, just say something about about that, you know, in a sense, the crystal ball, but also, I mean, 
you know, nationwide, not only on a branch front, but actually on other fronts is actually actively investing in and taking decisions about where you're going to put some of your technology development functions, for example, which, you know, are, are in our urban cores, right? So just say something uh, about that in a broader sense. So we have, we are just, we opened during the, during the pandemic, a 1200 seat uh, technology and new location in central London in Hoburn, which I think is now called Midtown. I think the local authority have renamed it. Um, and we still think that is the right decision. The difference is touching in on Helen's point is the way the space has been designed is to give people more choice about how they work. So whether it's a drop-in, you can book a desk, a room, a agile space, a collaboration space, or sit in the cafe, means there's less regiment about you have to be in the building five days a week, nine till five. It's more about giving our people choice about how and where they work. Um, I think Helen's right in some ways. I think it will be closer to where we were, but I don't think we'll go back to where we've been. I do think, however, don't underestimate the power of people reverting back to type. And what I mean by that is we're all humans, most of us. I think the ability to understand and what we are missing right now, and you'll probably experience this yourself personally, those serendipitous moments of knowledge share, the ability to put your arm around a colleague who's going through you know, some difficult times from a well-being point of view, or grabbing a coffee in the coffee queue and talking about stuff. Um, the CEO of Nationwide described it as our, our workplaces will be more like community centres. And what I mean by that is where people come together. Your workspace is your silent partner in your brand and your culture. And therefore, there's a key role for that. And the knock on effect on the local economy is really quite important. Whether that's you do spend less time in central London and more time in a commuting town, trying to predict what that means for retail space and hospitality is quite difficult. But I also think the role for workplace is really, really important and the need to develop and change it. I'd like to think nationwide are ahead of the game of that with the work we're doing on our new technology building. But we've still got work to do, as has others. Brilliant. Thank you very much. So, Sharon, give us a view of, you know, you touched in it towards the end of your initial remarks about, you know, the broader package of investment, the broader program of change that is going on in Sunderland and in, in the city centre. Just just say a little bit about why that is so important ultimately to you know the, to the performance of the of the city centre as a as a retail hub or as a retail destination. Okay, I think um, Sunderland are in a, in a strange place in terms of we don't have a huge amount of really good quality office accommodation now. So we are um, in the plan building a million square foot of new office accommodation. But I do think that gives us the opportunity to build it fit for the future, not fit for, for the past, if you like. And, and we're going to be ahead of the game in terms of other people will have to retrofit or whatever. But, but we will be able to build it um, build it fit for, for the new world, if you like. But at the same time, the cultural developments are massive and um, the health developments are massive. So there is a, a huge health um, building going on to the riverside. There's lots of housing going on to the riverside, but really good quality accommodation. So, you know, executive housing and a mix of all of that type of thing together, they will all need different things other than retail, but they will all still need retail as well. And I think, you know, we're in a good place in terms of we've got some of those plans in place. We, you know, there's lots of it either in planning or under development at the moment. Um, but it is a, it, when you look at the plans, it is a really good mix of commercial, residential um, and space to play, actually. Lots of outdoor space, lots of places for families to come. And families are really key to the future. All of the cultural developments are around families and all of the outdoor spaces around family. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Sharon. We're, we're uh, close to being out of time. But Paul, I just wanted you to come in because we've had several questions about you know, the nature of challenges in different places. Obviously, we are looking at questions about, uh, you know, I'm trying to think about big, small and medium, but we're also thinking about, you know, cities that were doing well, you know, coming into the pandemic versus those, I suppose, that were doing less well. Just just try to provide a, a bit of a sort of policy comment. It has um, has recovered at all um, from the first lockdown. It's almost as if it's just sort of remained in the first lockdown. Now, the two key reasons for that are that you know there are many millions of workers that work in the centre of London, which are coming in every day. They're going out at lunchtime after work, maybe even scouting in the afternoon. And also, you've got that element of international tourism coming in as well, which uh, which uh, 
which clearly is not going to have as big a role to play in the other cities, but you know, they're the two components of it. I think in these larger places, it's not until you start to see these workers come back again, are you then going to start to see a turnaround in, in their performance? Now, going back to Tony's question, you know, are they only going to come back in two days a week now? Well, let's see. And I can't wait to see where we fall on the, the spectrum that Helen set out. And we'll be doing that in the next couple of months as well to chart exactly what's going on. Um, but it's until you have that, that core of people back again, and that I don't think you'll then see that not an effect on, on the city centres. Now, for London, that's bouncing back to a position of strength. And a place, say, like Sheffield, for example, which is, is, is struggled more traditionally, there's a bigger challenge there about even getting back to where it was pre-pandemic levels is not ideally where we want it to be. And so there's going to have to be a... You know, a an intervention which is dealing with COVID, and then it's got to be a much longer term intervention, which is trying to improve the performance both of Sheffield City Centre, but actually of Sheffield as a city more generally. Brilliant, thank you very much. Um, time is against us, it's got us, it's nearly 12 o'clock. We didn't get uh, uh, many of the questions, I apologise for that. There's a kind of fascinating set of questions about assets and ownership and whether that matters to restructuring our, our high streets in the future. I think it probably uh, does. Who owns those assets? Uh, the degree to which they're prepared to uh, to move from the position they uh, they are currently or the way that they acquired them, I think is going to be a really significant um, issue uh, as we move forward and uh, as the vaccines um, roll out. Um, you'll find all the work that we've talked about and much, much more on our website, centrefacilities.org. Um, I'd like to thank my uh, three external speakers, Helen, Richard and Sharon. Thank you very much uh, for being with us. And obviously my colleague, uh, Paul, for sharing his thoughts and the analysis that we've um, been doing. Uh, this is our final event, or that this was our final event uh, of 2020. I think it's an understatement to say uh, it's been one hell of a year. Um, I wish you all, when you get to it, seems a while off yet, but nevertheless, when we get to it, uh, a joyous and safe uh, Christmas and New Year. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you again in 2021. Our next event in 2021 will be on January the 25th. That will be the annual publication of Cities Outlook, our uh, review of urban Britain. Uh, unsurprisingly, we'll be trying to take a kind of full stock take on what's happened to urban life uh, over the last 12 months and what does that mean for urban life for the next 12 months or indeed uh, beyond that. So look, look out for more details on that. But until we meet again, Go well and take care. Thank you very much for being involved. Take care. Bye-bye.